All right, welcome to Vital Voices. Uh, really excited to have you here and have you at home watching on this rainy night. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this Vital Voices, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but first I wanna talk a little bit about University of Houston downtown. We are the second largest university in Houston and the most diverse, not just in Texas, but in the southern region. I feel like we play a really important role in Houston and especially in downtown Houston. And part of that role is in our fields in the College of Public Service, we have social work, we have education, we have criminal justice, and our mission is to make a difference in the community while we train our students. So I'm particularly excited about this Vital Voices because it's a very important issue. I spent a lot of my career working in the field of domestic violence, uh, and it's a misunderstood and very difficult topic. And uh, the amount of family violence and intimate violence that's, that's happened since COVID has really gone up. So it, it's a very timely topic. Uh, so I'm excited to hear our esteemed speakers and faculty talk about this issue and for all of us to learn more about it and how we can make a difference. So thank you all for coming. And now I'm gonna introduce our director of our center and the person responsible for Vital Voices, Mr. Verlano. Thank you, Dean Schwartz. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Vital Voices. Um, uh, as you might know, Vital Voices is, uh, serves as a forum pr to bring the community members, professionals, practitioners to UHD, especially around the fields of social work, urban education, and criminal justice. Um, our guests speak from their professional experiences and expertise about their work and the work they do, how it impacts the community as well. So we, we purpose to showcase individuals whose work is interdisciplinary. So that would be you know, uh, interdisciplinary between the fields of criminal justice, social work, and urban education. Really couldn't get a better feel for that than the panel that we have here tonight. Over the years, we have uh, explored subjects such as addiction, youth in the criminal justice system, reducing recidivism, the graying of America, how social work impacts immigration, school violence, we're about to do a session in the spring term on school choice, uh, tackling the silent epidemic of childhood grief and trauma, bail reform, how law enforcement and mental health providers work together, uh, cognitive dissidents, voting justice, modern day slavery. Those are just a, to name a few from the past several years. So I know you don't want to just hear me babbling on, so I am going to introduce two of our, our, our criminal justice professors who have been kind enough to join me on the panel tonight. Casey Bleeker, uh, who is right here. Casey Bleeker received her PhD in criminology from the University of South Florida in 2023. Her main research agenda focuses on social cultural understandings of race, ethnicity, and gender, and how they shape the lived experiences of victims public opinions about victimization, and activism to address gender-based violence. Dr. Bleaser, Bleaker's research examines intimate partner violence, uh, otherwise known as IPV, in two critical areas, including exploring the experiences of black and Afro-Latina women domestic violence survivors and their interactions with the criminal justice system. She offers insights and recommendations for service providers through surveys and listening sessions conducted with survivors. And we also have with us Dr. Alondra Garza, who's gonna serve as our facilitator for the panel tonight. Her, her PhD is in criminal justice from, the, from Sam Houston uh, University in 2022. She is currently an assistant professor here in the Department of Criminal Justice and Social Work. Prior to joining UHD, Dr. Garza was an assistant professor at the University of Central Florida. Her research uses quantitative and qualitative methodologies and focuses on the criminal justice response to gender violence, including intimate partner violence and sexual assault. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Alondra, who will introduce the rest of the panel, and then we will start our discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I have the honor of introducing some wonderful panelists here with us today um, who all work in the field of domestic violence. So here with us today, we have Tisha Jenkins, who is the training director with Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, which is a nonprofit that coordinates the system response to domestic violence to increase victim safety, hold batters accountable, and prevent further acts of family violence. She's been developing curricula and training professionals in the fields of law enforcement, healthcare, education, and social services on the topics of domestic and sexual violence, emotional intelligence, and trauma-informed responses for over 25 years. We also have Jamie R. Wright, who is a resilience and encouragement speaker, advocate, activist, coach, and domestic violence survivor. Jamie has appeared on 60 Minutes, BBC News, NBC, CBS, Fox 26, numerous podcasts, and has been featured in several articles around the world. And then we have, or we'll have a um, couple of other panelists, including Jessica Ballant, who is the Education and Prevention Director at the Bridge Over Troubled Waters. And she received a master's in social work from the University of Michigan and has been part of the gender-based violence movement for 15 years. Jessica provides interactive workshops at the local, regional, and state levels concerning issues of domestic violence, sexual assault, and preventing these forms of violence. We also have with us today Kenneth Scott, who serves as the DVHRT coach for the Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council pilot program, which I'm sure we'll hear more about. His role is to provide coaching services that help individuals identify and adopt healthier coping mechanisms in their relationships. Kenneth's approach takes into account the individual's emotional history, their belief systems, and their peer associations to address really any underlying issues that may contribute to this dysfunctional behavior. And we also have with us today Larika Monique, who is a writer, speaker, and founder of the Agape Advantage, in which she is committed to helping women achieve their personal and professional aspirations. Her background in executive level development and community relations is showcased as the Chief External Affairs Officer at Breakthrough Collaborative. In 2021, her own domestic violence experience ignited her mission to dispel the myth that individuals like her are immune to such issues. And she's committed to ensuring that everyone learns how to authentically live in agape. So I guess we can sort of start having this discussion organically and um, that all the panelists can sort of feel free to contribute. Um, but why don't we start with maybe um, a definition of domestic violence, right? Sometimes we might hear different terms, right? We've probably already heard the term family violence, domestic violence, we've heard intimate partner violence. So um, maybe we can start talking a little bit about, you know, how do we actually define this issue that we're here to talk about today? Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Well, good evening to everybody. You know, before I dive in, I tend to be interactive, so I'd like to know what's on your mind. I'm going to give a definition. However, if I can get maybe one or two people to share with me what you think domestic violence is, and I will repeat it. And I see everybody's hands being raised. When you hear the term domestic violence, what comes up for you? Yes, go ahead. I'm going to repeat it. Okay, excellent, excellent. So I will paraphrase because I always like to honor the expertise in the room, and I think sometimes we forget to honor the expertise in the room. So what one of our attendees is saying is that domestic violence is when you're in a relationship and someone is being verbally, emotionally abusive, that they are coercing you to stay into, in that relationship. And by and large, that is the definition. When we talk about domestic violence, we're talking about individuals who are in a relationship, whether they are married, 
previously married, dating, or previously dated, where one person is exercising power and control over the other person through the tactics of verbal and emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, uh, economic abuse, which is huge, and we'll talk more about that. So, but at the root of it, we're talking about where one person exercises power and control over another. And what many women and men have told me over almost 28 years now is I feel as though I lost myself and I had no power over my own life. Anyone else want to add? Yeah, that, that's a mic drop. Um, yeah, I, I like that you pointed out sort of the different forms of, you know, what violence looks like, right? Like the name of our panel, it's not just physical. So definitely recognizing that it looks like economic abuse, right? Controlling someone's finances. It looks like psychological control, you know, isolating someone, taking that power and control. That's really the cusp or, right, exactly just like you said, um, in terms of understanding IPV how it's defined, how it occurs, that power and control aspect is, I think, so important. Um, so we're also going to talk a little bit about some of the initiatives uh, here in Harris County specifically, um, like the Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council and um, some of the other organizations that are here serving um, victims of domestic violence, holding perpetrators accountable uh, here specifically in Harris County. And let me introduce myself, Thesha. Thesha Jenkins, I'm the training director with the Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. So we've been around since around 1996. Uh, actually, the group came together, those who were in the criminal justice system here in Harris County were wanting a place to come and convene and to talk about the issues surrounding domestic violence. And so, hence the Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council was founded. And probably about 15 years ago, they actually were, were provided a grant to be able to hire actual staff. And so I am very pleased to say that I've been with the agency now for eight years, eight years. And I have the wonderful opportunity to work with two amazing women, plus a host of almost 40 other staff, including this gentleman here, who, who you'll be hearing from when we talk about accountability of the offender. So the Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, we are not a direct service program. We are based off the model of the Duluth model. By a show of hands, how many of you have heard that term, the Duluth model? Excellent. The rest of you, I want to say get your phones out. I am not moved by you having your phones out. Google is your friend. So look it up. So the Duluth model out of Duluth, Minnesota, I like to ex explain it as a clearinghouse for all things domestic violence. So we are based off of what is considered a coordinated community response. And the whole idea is that it is not just law enforcement and domestic violence agencies that have the onus of responding to this issue called domestic violence. What we know is that probably only about 33%, only 33% of domestic violence and sexual assault is ever reported. So that means 67% of individuals who are impacted by domestic and sexual violence are not reaching out. So the whole idea is that we want the whole community to take responsibility for what is happening in probably about 35 to 40% of homes right here in Houston and surrounding Harris County. So a coordinated community response looks at a systemic approach to responding to domestic violence. So we look at all the different systems. And so those systems include education, college and university level, K through 12. I'm going to even say for our preschool, that that's where we should have people trained. And our goal, my goal as a training director is to train individuals in these systems. So we have the education system, we have the healthcare system. And let me go backtrack a little bit. I'm gonna try to wrap this up in about two minutes because we've got some amazing people have things to say. So why do we want these systems trained? Well, because what we know is about 15 million children witness domestic violence in their homes every single year. So for those of you who are in education, can I see the hands of those of you who are gonna be pursuing education, maybe being teachers, okay? Not in this setting right now, but maybe watching later on. So that means that 15 million children every year witness domestic violence. So who is on the first line? educators. Title IX, for those of you here at college, Title IX, uh, you have professors, you've got school counselors who will recognize if you are in an abusive relationship. Secondly, healthcare. 
the healthcare arena. 33% of women who go to the emergency room are there because of domestic violence. So it is a great opportunity when we train healthcare providers. I've been working very closely with one of our local uh, pro hospital programs, and they are doing an amazing job of doing and identifying those who are at higher risk for death. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the domestic violence high risk team. Business, corporate America, about <laughs> $10 billion every year is lost in corporate America because of domestic violence. So we want those of you who are going to be HR directors, HR managers, supervisors, to be able to recognize domestic violence. The government, we've just come out of a legislative session. We want those people who are passing laws, making laws, to be more educated about why some things need to be addressed in a different manner, right? We also uh, working with law enforcement, right? We want law enforcement to be adequately trained and to have some empathy when they're going out and to be able also to give options. I've had the opportunity for about 15 to 20 years to do training with our local law enforcement. And what they talk about is that, wow, we didn't even know what resources were available. So we want to provide them that information. Why? Because another reason when it comes to a person actually getting out of an abusive relationship and when law enforcement shows up and they're encouraging her or him to call to the local domestic violence program, what we know is that there's a 75% turnaway rate. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk about what HCDVCC does. Faith-based community. There's a couple more, but I'm going to end it there. Faith-based community. For many people who have a faith that they subscribe to, their faith is everything to them. So for that person who is Christian, that person who is Muslim, that person who is Buddhist, they may not call 911, they may not go to a domestic violence program, but they're going to call their pastor, they're going to call their bishop, they're going to call the, 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 the Sikh or whatever those titles may be. And we want those individuals of faith to be in a place to provide sound information and referral and not to respond by saying, just pray a little bit harder. <laughs> or if that person's been sexually assaulted, well, now that you've been sexually assaulted, the right thing to do is to marry them. And those are the things that I have heard in 28 years. So Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, we are committed to increasing access to safety and services for survivors of domestic violence, holding those who cause harm accountable, and most importantly, preventing homicides. What we know is that in 2022, there were 216 homicides across the state of Texas. 216. I was at another event two weeks ago, and the uh, lieutenant with HPD shared that there had been 50 homicides since the beginning of the year. So from January to October, there have been 50 homicides. So we are committed to being able to help systems respond, recognizing that everyone will not be in contact with law enforcement or go to a domestic violence program. Thank you. Hi, everybody. First, I apologize for being late. Um, wow, my driving skills apparently need work. Missed a couple turns. Um, but I am Jessica Ballant. I'm the Education and Prevention Director at the Bridge Over Troubled Waters. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization in Pasadena serving all of Southeast Harris County. Um, we serve all survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, and stalking. All of our services are free and we're, we are truly there. We, we work closely with Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council to make sure every survivor has support, has a safe place to go, has access to healing. Um, um, and, and, and that's through many different ways. We have a 24-hour hotline, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We're there to answer those crisis calls. We have therapists to do individual counseling for free. We know that mental health services are not very accessible in Houston, right? They are expensive. Um, we have support groups for individuals to come in. We know that most people, um, they, they heal in community with other survivors, right? Healed people heal people, right? Just like we know hurt people hurt people. Those who are healed helped heal others. And so we really work on promoting our support groups so that survivors can come together, hear each other, know they're not alone in what they've been through and be there for one another. We, ha we do have a shelter. Um, just as Thesha was saying, with that, with that turnaway rate, as far as uh, shelters fall, we're one of those shelters that is almost always at capacity. I'm not going to sugarcoat things here, right? Uh, we have a struggle with meeting housing needs. Um, in addition to housing 
shelter. We do have permanent housing as well. Um, so we do have those programs. I'm in education and prevention, and so I get to have the privilege to be in so many different spaces. How do we talk about what is domestic violence? What are healthy relationships? We work with a lot of young people in schools. Uh, we work with professionals as well. How can we really start changing social norms so that domestic violence isn't a norm, right? Because we know nationally, I came in a little late, so I don't know if, if Thesha said this, but one in three women, right, y'all? One in three women at some point in their lifetime will experience domestic violence. One in three teens while they're teenagers. This is far too many people, right? I always say, whenever I speak in front of folks, if we ourselves are not survivors, we know someone who is, someone close to us in every single space. There's survivors in every room. So what, how are we getting involved, right? Um, and so those are some things. We do community organizing work, really looking at the, how do we promote empathy? Because people who are more empathetic, they're not going to harm the people in their lives. People who feel a sense of community, how do we help people? How do we help make sure communities are offering spaces and events and bringing people together, right? Emotional well-being, right? How do we enhance emotional well-being? Make sure people are connected with loved ones, mentors, people who care about them, and a community that cares about them, right? People who feel connected to their community and other people in their neighborhood and their lives are much less likely to perpetrate violence. How do we end perpetration, not keep victims from being victimized, right? That, that's not helping anybody. So how do we really change social norms so this isn't happening anymore? Those are, that's one of the wonderful things I get to do. We also do Legal advocacy with survivors, safety planning. These should mention Title IX. We have we serve people of all ages, of all genders. A lot of people think we only serve women and children. Y'all, we know domestic violence happens to one in four men too. One in four men just in our country, right? So we serve anyone of any gender, any age. We work with a lot of young people who we know a lot of bullying. What is bullying? A lot of times bullying, we think about bullying in middle school, high school. What does that actually look like? Any ideas? Demeaning, oftentimes it looks like a lot like sexual harassment. It looks like sexual violence, right? When we think about a lot of bullying and those behaviors, a lot of it is sexual harassment and it falls under Title IX. A lot of parents and young people don't know the, the bullying that they're experiencing, whether it be online or in person, can fall under Title IX and can be addressed K through 12, not just at the university level, right? Um, so I don't, I don't want to take up too much space. I know we have a lot of people. Thank y'all. I'm happy to be here. Once again, I'm so sorry for being late. Anyone want to share on that side? Need to add to that? I think we've sort of started to segue into sort of the, the consequences of domestic violence. And um, you've mentioned a little bit, obviously, we know homicide and intimate partner homicides um, are, are the worst consequence of domestic violence. Um, so I think it's important to sort of talk about, obviously, um, some of the consequences, right, for the victim, but not only the victim, right? The effects of domestic violence are far reaching beyond um, the particular victim, right? It affects children, communities, um, families. So I think hearing a little bit about the issues of how far reaching the consequest consequences of domestic violence are is important to chat about as well. I was just told I have to go first. Listen, y'all, sorry for being late like Jessica. Um, I was rushing to get here. I'm honored to be here. I'm kind of curious that I may have missed this. Who's in the room? Who made it intentional to come out on this wet, like horrible night to hear about domestic, uh, domestic violence? Who's in the room? Real quick. Like some of the people, who are you, sir? Hi, Philip. And what brings you here tonight? Thank you. Oh, how do I know? So thank you for for being of support, Philip. You're yeah, you're an ally. I I honor you, sir. Who else is in the room? Right on. Thank you. Who who else? Lord bless you. Okay. 
So what am I, so y'all, my name is Jamie Wright. I am an unapologetic, intentional survivor turned advocate of domestic violence. I never in a million years thought I'd be um, doing this thing, raising awareness um, around domestic violence because I did all the things right. I overcame adversity of coming home pregnant at 14 and managed to get a, um, a, a master's and all that stuff and, and, and get a six figure uh, job but but found myself homeless very much homeless um, at the Houston Area Women's Center in 2020 and so I f find it more impactful to just open my heart and my authentic self up in environments like this and allow myself to um, be of service to y'all so you all can ask me whatever questions you need to ask from my point of view to equip you to go out and do the things that the universe has called you to do. Because now I know y'all, I didn't even know this was a movement, right? I, I, I've seen domestic violence growing up, so I just thought it was what love looked like. But now that I understand it's a movement and it's been people doing this work well before I came along, and it's people still doing the work, Y'all, I'm always honored and I'm always at service to you all to get the tools that you need from me, the hard questions answered, uh, so that you can go out and, and just be great and we fight this fight together. So that's who I am. I don't, I'm not gonna go through a whole spiel. I have the honor of being a part of um, Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating, Count, Coordinating Council's uh, pilot pro program, Voices of Freedom. Thesha, uh, she doesn't like it, but I mean, at this point, you're like, well, our fearless leader has taken us up under her wings and given us her uh, 20 plus years of commitment and wisdom and uh, given us her time on late nights like this to, a, and I say uh, us, because I have some bad to the bone sisters in the movement too. We're looking for brothers too, though. Um, equipping us to go out and share our voices in such a way that it makes it hard for people that make decisions to act like as, as, as if it's not happening. So again, my apologies for being late. I'm absolutely stoked and honored to be here with y'all tonight. Hi guys, how do I follow that introduction? <laughs> I am Larika Monique, and if somebody would have told me 10 years ago that I would be sitting here having a conversation about domestic violence, I would have told them no, because I've done all the right things to prevent myself from being there. I think we opened up the session with saying that domestic violence is often misunderstood. It's misunderstood. It does not have a face. It does not have a name. It does not have an economic status. And I now know that it can happen to anyone, anywhere, at any time. So when we talk about the implications and the impacts of domestic violence, I'll take you to just real quickly in 2021, when I told my partner that I was going to leave my home, I was strangled for 21 minutes and I was almost five months pregnant with my then seven and a half year old daughter in the home. As a black woman, I was terrified to call the police. We live in Third Ward, and the only thing I could think about was CPS is going to take my child. I also was in denial because I was misinformed, and I did not think that it could happen to someone like me. Thankfully, when I went to, I went to the emergency room and um, my nurse, helped walk me through what I had just experienced. And when the officer showed up for the report, I was still terrified and confused. Fast forward, I was too a little bit late. Um, my daughter, who's now 10, we found out today that she is having some mental health challenges because of the trauma and the impacts of domestic violence. I was called to the school today with her team and they told me that in order for her to return back to school, you guys need to get clearance from a, psych a, psychiatrist, a, a psychiatrist. 
So when you think about the impacts of domestic violence, and I really am trying to still understand my own healing journey and my own journey. Guys, I have resources, and so I was able to fund all of uh, my daughter and I, we fled to San Diego. I came back, I put 24 hour surveillance on my home. I was able to call a few people because I'm resourced and I have relationships to help ensure that the person that caused harm was um, arrested. I was also able to find therapy for myself, but what I did not realize was that there was a young person sitting there with me who also experienced what I experienced. And now as a family, we're trying to figure out what's next for us. So when I think about one, being misinformed about domestic violence, I'm so grateful that all of you guys are here because more than likely someone you know is experiencing some form of domestic violence or they have experienced domestic violence. So it's up to us to inform ourselves on what it could look like. Guys, someone mentioned, I think it was Thesha, about the church. So I, when I experienced the situation, the first community that I went to was one, my family, who they were misinformed, who I have not talked to in two years. I'm gonna say that again, because they are misinformed, I have not talked to them in two years. Why? Because them acknowledging that I experienced ab abuse means that they also have to acknowledge that someone, them, they also either is a person that's causing harm or experience abuse and they're not ready to deal with that situation. So now I have a fractured relationship with my family. And secondly, I went to my church, the, the, the community of which I thought could support me. And my, my ex-partner, he called and one of the ladies, she said, oh, he's calling and he's praying. And he's, he wants to come to the church. And I said, I'm not safe. He cannot come here. And I need your support to help me understand how to navigate through this. The support that they shared with me was, let's pray about it. Well, fast forward, I get, I'm very fortunate that um, I'm very comfortable now with being an advocate and being a part of the movement and, and serving as a voice of freedom, not just for myself, but I believe in being here and sharing my voice. It also liberates other people that now I'm able to um, approach spaces and places where there are women that look like me, that feel, other people feel, you'll never experience this. And I'm also able to advocate in, within the church community. And my church has been very supportive. Um, so the implications are far, far vast. It impacts you as a person. It chips away at your self-esteem. You often isolate yourself. And while you, you guys know what happens when you isolate yourself, um, it impacts you financially. It doesn't matter whether you make $20,000 a year or make $200,000 a year. Your life is going to be impacted financially. It impacts you physically. I held on to 70, 70 pounds of weight because I was so stressed out for so long. And not only that, but my daughter, we're now trying to figure out what healing look, looks like for her. So if, if you guys are here and you're thinking about maybe a friend or a loved one and maybe potential implications and they have children, just know that your support and understanding the implications not only helps them, but also could potentially help their child. And I'm here to answer any questions you guys might have as well. At this point, I, I want to go ahead and interject because when Steve reached out about having this forum, it was about dismissing the myths about domestic violence, that it's always about the physical abuse and definitely physical is a part of it. So I just wanna take a little bit of time, a couple, about three minutes to do a quick overview of what we call the power and control wheel. And it's something that I believe very deeply and I kiddingly tell people sometimes that I carry a power and control wheel in one hand and the Bible in the other. That's how much I believe in that bad boy. And again, I wanna encourage you, Google is your friend, so look it up while I'm talking. Simply put in power and control wheel, power and control wheel. And in this movement, we love wheels. We just keep on rolling, right? So when we talk about domestic violence, I want to talk about eight characteristics of a relationship that 
demonstrates what domestic violence is. Knowing that the physical violence and the sexual violence is what holds that will together, however, there are tactics. And everybody just say the number one. one. Say it one more time. One. It only takes one of these tactics that I'm gonna briefly discuss with you that shows what an abusive relationship is. So number one is verbal and emotional abuse. If you are in a relationship where your partner is constantly saying, what in the world are you going to University of Houston downtown? Ain't nobody gonna give you no job. Are you, are you serious? You're so stupid, I can't even believe they even let you in. They must, they need money at UHD. <laughs> That's the only reason you're there, right? So if that is the conversation that is happening where you are constantly being put down, right? And why is it a tool for power and control? Because it takes away one's self-esteem and self-efficacy. And that is why the person may choose to stay in that relationship because they begin to believe, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough. So verbal and emotional abuse. Isolation, that is where your partner keeps you away from family and friends. No, we're not going to see your grandma for Thanksgiving. That woman has never ever liked me. You see how she look at me? No, we are not going. What do you mean you gotta go to that, that program at UHD? I know, you, you, you're gonna go sleep with somebody. That's what it is. And so you find yourself not going, being here at this event tonight because you don't want your partner to think that you were with someone else. And slowly but surely, you're not hanging out with friends and family. You're not doing anything. Your partner becomes the only person in your life. Minimizing, denying, and blaming, often called gaslighting. Well, are you sure that that's what I told you? Because you know, you've been taking your meds lately. I'm just saying, yeah, right? Using children. Oh, leave me if you want to, but, uh, K. Scott Jr. ain't going nowhere. You got me messed up. Oh, I don't put them people in your life. You know we had that, that CPS case a while back. I'll keep on walking. The person chooses to stay in that relationship. Number one is that people are afraid of losing their children. So they make a really great leveraging system. Okay? Economic abuse. 99% of survivors of domestic violence have experienced economic abuse. What that looks like is that I go up to K. Scott's job every single day, and finally they say, K. Scott, you know what? We really are going to have to let you go. You know, you've been late a lot. Well, they don't know that I hit K. Scott's uh, keys so that he couldn't get to work. They don't know that I kept him up all night long, fussing and cussing and going on, and he overslept because I finally let him go to sleep at 5 o'clock when I knew that he had to be out the door at 7. So that's economic abuse. They don't know that I am messed up his credit and maybe uh, Jamie will share some information about the credit that K. Scott came into this relationship with a whole 750, but by the time he left me, he had a whole 200 credit score because I was running up all, I was getting all kind of credit cards in his name. Why? Because I'm his intimate partner and I have access to his social security number, right? Male privilege, also called decision-making privilege. Male privilege being that, you know, so I'm getting ready to leave my partner and Maybe someone, my pastor, someone who cares about me says, well, you know, according to Ephesians 5, you're supposed to submit. And, you know, you're going to bust hell wide open because there's no reason to divorce your partner. Okay? Our decision making, the fact that I'm 57, 58, no, 57, I'm 57, don't age me, <laughs> 21. <laughs> see, it says that, see, I'm dating Kay Scott, who's a whole under 30, and that jealousy factor comes in because I have more life experience than Kay Scott. And I'm like, well, Kay Scott, you know what? You know, I've been around for a while, and I really think you should make that decision. I'm using decision making privilege, also part of what we consider part of that patriarchy. Even though I am female, I take on that patriarchal role because of my age. Maybe I make $200,000 a year, and he makes $45,000. So again, I'm in that patriarchal role because I have the ability to make the decisions in that relationship. Coercion and threats. I wish you would leave me, K. Scott. I bet that bullet get in your back before you get to that front door. Or I know that you haven't filed your IRS forms in the last three years. I bet Uncle Sam would like to have a talk with you. K. Scott, you leave me, my life will never be the same. I might as well blow my brains out. That's coercion and threats that I make him feel guilty about leaving me. Intimidation. Yeah, you feel that, right? I don't have to say a word. It's all in my eyes. It's all in my body language. Those are the things that are happening to about 35 to 40% of residents in Houston and Harris County every nine seconds. And in none of those scenarios that I just shared with you was anybody physically harmed. <laughs> that is domestic violence. So I just wanted to set the stage so that we know 
exactly what we are talking about. All right? Yeah, I think this is a good segue to talk about, um, you know, I think we've established that domestic violence can happen to everybody, right? This Duluth model, some of my students are here, they're like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, right? Be preaching it. Um, but we also know, right, that the background and like the different identities that one carries, right, are going to impact, right, maybe the way some of these tactics work, right? This, this Duluth model, if you've Googled it, um, it's been um, sort of revised to sort of fit, right, from this intersectional perspective, meaning we're considering someone's race and ethnicity, someone's gender, someone's sexual orientation, right? Domestic violence tactics might look differently. Um, so for instance, right, let's say you're here, right, you're an immigrant, maybe you don't have papers, so maybe these threats are going to look like, I'm going to call the cops, I'm going to deport you. Maybe they hold your passport, right? So the, these threats look different in terms of intimidation, right, if you are, um, you know, LGBTQ+, plus, your family doesn't know your gay, I'm going to out you. Right, so this looks differently, and so it's super important to contextualize. Yes, domestic violence happens to everybody, but our sort of intersectional background in terms of the different identities that we carry, right, race, ethnicity, gender, age, socioeconomic status, they all sort of intersect to shape our own experiences of domestic violence, but also how does the criminal justice system respond to us? How do we seek help from advocacy centers? Do we seek help from advocacy centers? Um, so this idea of intersectionality is really important to think about um, issues of domestic violence. I'll actually build on off of that really quick. Um, so kind of, pulling all of this together, right? Um, Alondra brings up a lot of great points about the idea of intersectionality and the way that impacts, you know, who's most at risk and kind of their experiences, right? But I think one of the most important things to talk about, specifically since we have people from uh, the bridge and the coordinating council is the idea of help seeking and how that kind of impacts those long-term effects um, as well as how it kind of affects the community and things like education. And so a lot of my research, um, I come from Tampa, Florida, so a lot of my research is from the Florida area, and I will say you guys are doing way better here in terms of training and advocacy, which is fantastic. Um, that's very important, particularly when you get into training of all of the different services that victims or survivors seek after their experiences, right? So typically we see this as people calling the police or seeking medical care, but it really is far lar larger and wider than that as lots of our advocates and survivors kind of suggest that it's your community, it's the church that you go to, it's your family and friends. Um, and so one of the biggest things that we see for people seeking help is that your immediate support system, so particularly your friends and family who you speak with on a daily basis are one of the biggest factors for predicting further help seeking behavior. So particularly for all of you being here, students and community members, that's probably one of the biggest things is just being aware of it, being able to even help individuals who have experienced it know what actually happened to them and encouraging to do what they need to to get help, right? We know intersectionality wise that not every service provider is the best for everyone. So we can't just necessarily encourage people to call the police or to seek medical help or to go to a domestic violence service provider Different things help different people based on how they culturally understand the situation. So having advocacy that is culturally and trauma informed is so important to kind of those long-term effects. But I think one of the biggest things that we're talking to here is understanding the general definition and kind of those immediate outcomes. So we think about how victims and survivors are more likely to experience physical um, outcomes long-term. So having unwanted pregnancies or trouble with their pregnancies following abuse or mental health issues with having a higher likelihood of depression and anxiety, but how that kind of affects things further as well, right? Um, we had you talk about how um, you're really scared in your experience with your child, right? And a lot of women are very fearful, not only, well, if I'm not experiencing a physical or a sexual form, like how will that affect my child, right? Um, I think one of the biggest things is fear of your child being taken away really affects the long-term impacts of, it's not just an immediate, thing, right? It's not an immediate threat. Your child isn't just going to be taken away from a day or for a week or for months. Typically, these things are very long term. And so individuals have to work with that experience for months and months following this experience. 
We also find that it really affects individuals' trust and legitimacy with help seeking services in the future. So if you have a poor experience working with law enforcement or a service provider or with medical care following, you're much less likely, no matter what the experience is in the future, to call those services. And when you don't call those services, more than likely you're going to experience even more adverse outcomes. So understanding, I think, the totality and how long these outcomes kind of affect people is very, very important. But I think the biggest thing is understanding that this doesn't look one way for most people and that we need to be kind of understanding of where people are coming from and how they understand their experience and then encouraging them moving forward. But that help seeking kind of piece is kind of the biggest thing I think here that's most important to everything we'll probably talk about this evening. Um, I think maybe to piggyback off of that and um, cover a few more points, maybe some barriers to help seeking, right? Um, and we've started to sort of touch upon this when we sort of, um, you mentioned, right, we turn away a lot of survivors. Um, I had a statistic from the National um, Network to End Domestic Violence. Agencies have turned away over um, approximately 12,000 survivors. So your help, you're looking for help, right? Help seeking is important, right? We need, we're turning to somebody. Um, but what happens when you when they say we're full, we don't have money? Um, I'll tell a little bit about my um, work recently related to this, um, and then I'll let some folks sort of talk about this specific to Harris County. Um, so some of the issues that are affecting the agencies that are supposed to be helping survivors, right? What happens when agencies can't do that? Um, so. A lot of my work has been focusing on preventing intimate partner homicide in the Latino community. So working with community-based, culturally specific domestic violence organizations across the country to prevent or to develop, right? Like culturally specific, some of these issues are unique. Um, and what do advocates tell us? There's homicides because we don't have funding. Housing is an issue. Housing is a domestic violence issue right, the intersection of homelessness and domestic violence. We don't have enough advocates. On average, advocates make approximately $40,000 per year. People are burnt out after COVID, right, the great resignation. We don't have advocates. We don't have advocates that um, look like the survivors in some agencies, right? Um, that's important in terms of, th these are some of the barriers that are inhibiting help seeking, right? We don't have enough funding um, and funding keeps getting cut. So this is a really crucial area in terms of there's not equitable resources to support um, the great work that all of these organizations do, unfortunately, is something that I think a lot of community-based organizations are dealing with, and it's, it's an issue that we need to speak about and advocate for. Yeah, I know it's one that we struggle with at the bridge, um, and we really are. What we have talked about is like, okay, when we're looking at where we're at capacity, what does the conversation with that survivor look like? We're calling our sister agencies. Okay, they're at capacity, right? I've been at the hospital for hours with survivors calling different places. They're always the same thing. We're full, we're full. Okay, so this person, what is safety risk? They don't have anywhere to go with their family. They don't have somewhere to go with their friends. What we have done is said, okay, if this is like real safety risk, they got nowhere else to go. We are literally pulling out sleeping bags, getting couches out in our shelter, but that is not, that's only a temporary fix. That can't be long-term, right? What about when we have a, a mom with seven kids? I've had that, seven children, right? I got lucky that night because things, we got talking, I didn't immediately, because I think also there's, how are we as advocates making sure, okay, you know what, let's talk more, let's learn more, let's figure out what's going on, let's get creative. Um, and, and I think that that is really important. And so we were lucky in that situation that we were able to get law enforcement intervention. There were stuff going on with the children right then and there. They were able to make an arrest and we were able to get that mom back home and know that, nope, that dad is not going to be able to come back into that home, right? At least in the short term. <laughs> um, because when we also talk about barriers to leaving, when someone's arrested for domestic violence, how long are they going to stay in jail? Is it even 24 hours? Maybe not. Right, and so we have to safety plan and figure out, okay, what happens if they come back, right? Um, and so it, it is an issue. We're working, I mean, 
leg I mean, legislative advocacy is important. Talk to your senators, talk to your representatives. We need more funding. We need more housing. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, that is, that is a main issue. Anyone else want to talk about that? Yeah, I want to check, 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 check. Y'all can hear me, right? So I finally want to get open up a little bit. And I'm like this, y'all. I love interaction. That's something that keeps me going. I'm very energetic. And I want you guys to do me a quick favor. All right. Each one of y'all look across the room. Look around the room real quick. Just scan each across the room. All right. And I want y'all, just one person, it can be two or three of them, point out one thing, noticeable thing in this room. Go ahead. You, you're looking at me, so you just got it. And you swag, swagged out, so I got to call on you right here. What's one noticeable thing that you can see within this room? Okay, someone else. What's another What's another noticeable thing within this room? Oh, okay. So she said there's a lot of uh, chairs full in this room. <laughs> so what's another thing that you can notice in this room? Bingo. So the, it's a, the, the answer that she said was there's a majority of women in this room. And so I always ask the question to myself is, what more can we as men do, right? It's no, like like uh, far-fetched idea to think that 93% of victims in domestic violence are women. So what are we doing as men to kind of close that gap to where we can better help that and decrease that number? And so she mentioned a lot of things. Obviously, we need more advocates, more funding. Like, just to give you a contextual idea about what it is, and hopefully I'm not going too far forward, but here at DV, uh, ACDVCC, we're inheriting a new pilot program, right? And so I'll give you a little context around it. So the Harris County Domestic Violence Harris, uh, the Harris County Domestic Violence High Risk Team, uh, they're a, pr a proven homicide prevention model, right? It was organized in 2018, Texas Council on Family Violence. Uh, it was grant awarded by the District Attorney Office. So in 2020. They handed it over to ACDVCC, and our two main goals were to provide safety and support for our victims, but also on the opposite side is providing accountability and rehabilitation services for the individuals that are doing harm. And so when I speak of re rehabilitation services, I want to give you guys a picture. I love painting pictures. I'm not Picasso or anything, but I love to give people vivid images, all right? So I'm a former athlete, right? Played at a high level. And so when I got injured, I was a wide receiver. I could run, jump, you name it, right? All that at the top of my level. But when I got injured, what happened? I had to learn how to walk again, right? A lot of times when individuals are going through these patterns of abusive behavior, these are learned behaviors for a long time. So in order to rehabilitate them, we have to start from ground zero to teach them how to learn how to walk again. Right, and that starts from their childhood. All right, we mentioned a lot of child I mean, children like see visually what their parents are going through. Right, so in the process of rehabilitation, right, for me as a coach, the person that's wanting to help them out, I have to understand their past to see where they're at presently to, in, in order to change their future. Right, so it's kind of that spectrum and alignment in regards to that. And so for me in the DVHRT program, uh, we're connecting with individuals who are on probation that are required to go to these BIT programs. BIT programs, they're batterer intervention prevention programs, they are magnificent. They do a wonderful job. However, it's not long term. It's only 18 weeks. And so there's a scientist in the late 1800s that came up with this concept of the forgetting curve. How many of you in here, when you guys take a test, you're good, but if someone would have told you to take that same test tomorrow, you have a failing grade. Am I the only one? Right? That's the same thing with the individuals that are harm doers. They go to the 18-week program, but they're not continuing on with the services, so therefore everything that they were taught is now getting declined in their memory bank, so they don't really know no better. So for us in the, in the program is to teach them how to have these micro wins as goals, as not only a parent, a person, and a partner. So the first week may look like, this week I want to be a better person. So what goals do you want to write down? So as long as we're always striving for something, then the gap of them and that memory bank of the deteriorating will no longer be there because they will always be working towards rehabilitation, always working on the information that they learn from the BIT programs to keep on acquiring in that training. And then hopefully in the future, just like an AA program, that they will create a community amongst each other. And that community will go out into a community like this, the numbers of men 
will eventually go up. It balances out. And then one crazy stat is that two-thirds of individuals who attend a BIT program go back and the recidivism, recidivism rate is 67%. That's crazy. That's crazy. So you're telling me you spend four and a half months in a classroom only to go back? That's crazy to me. That's maniacal. Like, why would you want to do that? And so just uh, bringing this bigger picture for them to understand the other side. And for me, I feel like everybody has the, the capacity to change. Everybody does. Like, I'm, I'm going to get spiritual. Sorry. Excuse me. But, you know, I feel like it's hypocritical for people to always ask God for forgiveness, but they can never forgive someone else. How hypocritical is that? Right? So that's why I say everybody has the capacity to change. Right? And so and to change, for me, I look at it in five steps. You have to be aware of the situation that's been done. Right? After you're aware of the situation, the next step is the desire part. Do you have the desire? Honestly, some people, they don't have the desire. Right? However, you don't give up on them. You lead them to that water and make them thirsty. You can't force them to drink. You just make them thirsty by providing that value, providing the other side. And then after they understand and get that desire, you give them the knowledge, the stuff that they learn through the BID program, the stuff that you're teaching them, and the stuff that they're learning on their own through wisdom and experience. And after they're equipped with that knowledge, then they have the ability to become the person who they set out to become and, and basically who the person in the relationship thought they would be. Right? And the last step is reinforcement. Staying true to what you say you was going to do long after the move you set it in has left. So how do you reinforce it? You create micro wins along the way. You have a continuum of care so that they can be always like focused on the goal. Because if you're just out in the weight of the water, you're just going to be floating everywhere. But if you see a shore head, at least you know where a point to go to in order to get there, to be on land, to be able to build some colonization, something, right? And so that's why I feel like this, this program, despite the lack of funding, despite the, the, the pay, I mean, to me, honestly, I'm at this point, I can care less about pay. I love impact. Like, you give me something, I want to make an impact. I want to be known forever. You know what I'm saying? That's the type of, that type of energy I'm on, right? I want to be able to make an impact, because I know if I help you, you're going to be able to help somebody else or your kid that's going to want to grow up and be like you, right? Because I'm a product of the same thing. Domestic violence growing up, right? Mom crying in another room, stepfather coming out of the, uh, angry, mad. I'm wondering what's going on, right? And so for me, just to give you a, a context, um, it's my personal life. You know, looking back at that situa situation for me, and I remember my wife and I, we're both uh, former athletes, and we were in the kitchen, right? We were having a debate on sports. Crazy. Like, I'm like, who's the greatest player of all time? You know, she was talking about Magic Johnson, whoop de whoop right? So my daughter's in the other room, and my daughter comes around the corner. Me and my, I get animated when I'm in debate. I'm like, babe, look, this is the greatest player. Look at his stats. Look at his stats, whoop de whoop and so we're, we're, we're debating. It wasn't crazy. It wasn't like no, no, no bad thing or anything. It was just debating. It was funny. And so my daughter comes around the corner and says, can y'all stop fighting? And we're like, fighting? And so that moment right there was a moment for us to educate her on what, what it is we were doing, giving her a context around it. So now that she knows what exactly what was happening, but also, like, if she goes into another environment or another situation, then she knows, like, how to go about it in a situation, too. So it's like educating our child based on our real-life experiences so that they can be able to, like, pass on from generation to generation to generation to generation, et cetera. And so long story short, I feel like everybody has the capacity to change. I feel like if we keep on helping individuals rehabilitate themselves to go from, to go, to be the person that they set out to become, then the whole world will be a better place, and this whole room will be filled up with not only just women, but more male, more, more men, in order to push the, the initiative forward. I just want to make a quick comment on that, and I think it's really important to talk about the idea of rehabilitation, because it's something we don't often think about. I think people who are in the field of criminal justice, we're all talking about like punishment and jail time and incarceration, and a lot of times, when we don't really think through the situation, we assume that most victims probably want their partner that's been abusing them to also see jail time. We assume that that's just, for people who haven't experienced victimization, that's often the automatic assumption. Um, but research that I've done with um, multiple survivors has actually found that 
they don't necessarily want to see their partner see jail time, or that's not necessarily what's going to make them feel justice because they understand that a lot of these behaviors are learned over time. And so oftentimes they do want to see their partner be rehabilitated. Maybe they also would feel justice seeing incarceration time too, but they want them to get better. And so I think that's something that we need to think about is a lot of times when we hear about friends or family being victimized, we're like, we want them to see jail time. We want awful things that happen to them, but that's not necessarily the response we always need. And I think rehabilitation and understanding kind of that concept really makes us think more about how ingrained a lot of these behaviors are and how we can change and advocate for people to change and hopefully reduce domestic violence with that as well. So I think the thing that you're doing with rehabilitation is fantastic, but also understanding that that is also an option for offenders following domestic violence too is really important of a concept to understand. And um, good evening, everybody. It is, okay. Uh, my name is Luz Lopez. I'm one of the Hispanic advocates in my neighborhood uh, back in um, Cloverleaf area. Um, I work hand on hand with the Harris County Sheriff Department and the Unidos um, uh, section uh, agency, which we specialize in uh, bringing the information to the Hispanic community. And it's very important for us to know that when we call the police and we put a report we need to file charges. We need to know how the charges are being put in the, in the aggressor. And yes, it comes to a lot of people not wanting to put charges. And they have the situation be repeated one more time. So when is the aggressor going to stop? When is he going to stop if he's not seeing any consequences or really believing that you want that violence to stop? You know, so it comes to where I have to come to family uh, and, and speak with the whole family and try to bring a, some results to avoid a father being in jail or a mother being beaten or, you know, tragically, you know, killed at, as that. We have to understand that it's just not the parents having the, the um, aggression, but now their children are adopting that um, aggressiveness with brother and sister. You know, now they're act having that domestic violence and they think now that by being aggressive, they're going to have respect because that's what the father has taught him, that he has to scream, he has to beat, he has to, you know, um, be a little bit more, um, you know, to ask for that uh, uh, respect in the home. I was speaking to one of the family members and she's a very Christian lady and she says, you know what? I've noticed, Ms. Lopez, that when it comes to women having rights be heard, the men think that we're just taking off their manhood. And now that's why they want to take their uh, rules in their hands and try to make you, as the woman, understand that they're the boss at the home. So what, if we see how our, um, our uh, people are being protected, of course, is the men and the women, then the animals, doggies and cats, you know, and then at the end is the men. So what is it that we're doing today to help parents come united and have better healthy relationships? What are we doing? We need to get educated. We need to come into a, a family night, like a lot of schools had family night today. We only always see just mom coming in. Why don't we see both of the parents? A lot of them, they work. Yes, we understand that, you know? But when they come home, do we even talk about what happened at family night with the parents, the, the one that didn't go home with, you know? It doesn't happen. You know, 70% of the time it does not happen. So the husband is always just the breadwinner, bringing the money home, and that's all he cares about. Why? Because us as women, have not brought him in to be a part of the relationship with our children. We're having classes every Tuesday with the Latino community out there, trying to educate them a little bit more of how having uh, healthy relationships, how to do their homeworks together as, as a family, you know, will help our children be better at school. There's a lot of kids that come home, bring homework, and mom's watching TV, father's watching the game, opposite rooms, and the son or the baby, they're doing their homework in the kitchen or in the living room. 
without nobody helping them. So how is it that we want to change these kids' mind to be better for tomorrow if we're not even doing our part? And I'm very strict with you know the families that I help because it's like, I want you to help me, but then you don't want to put the, your, the effort to, to get the help. You know, and I do share that with, uh, with um, our panel because we have to understand that it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility for our children's education. It's our responsibility to have kids out of drugs, out of gangs. I can probably tell you that I've met so many parents that they don't know where their kids are at after school because they have to work. We have to keep an eye on our children. We have seen and heard of so many suicide when our kids are by themselves in, in the house because mom and dad are not paying attention to the kids. And they don't listen to our children knowing they're going through bullying at, at school. So we need to pay a little bit more attention, look for those classes, look for organizations that are giving um, those educational workshops to help us understand what can we do or change that chip in our mind, you know, and make a better uh, relationship with our families. And I believe that that would help a lot, you know, because if, if it comes to um, avoiding any domestic violence at home, it's because we're having more communication. I know that we're getting ready to do some Q&A, and I think if you've heard Luz's heart, uh, it really is around the youth. And so I want to put this on the table, and then definitely uh, Mr. Volano read my mind, because here's the thing, you took time out of your night to be here, and I want to make sure that when you walk out of those doors, you're like, the pizza was good, but I even got some information. <laughs> so very briefly, talking about children, something that I have become committed to and I, I had wrote down on my paper, ADL, and that's something I try to remind myself as I listen to the panelists and thank everybody for everything that you said. Uh, ADL means always be learning. And so I love to drink in what other people are talking about. And so as we get ready to transition into Q&A, I want you to start thinking about what question do you want answered tonight? Talking about children, how many of you are familiar with adverse childhood experience by a show of hand? Ooh, we, yes, 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 yes. So questions around that. We've got some amazing experts up here that are that, that's their that's their jam. I came became aware of adverse childhood experience probably about four years ago, and I believe that it should be taught in every middle school and high school before anybody ever even thinks about reproducing. Because everything that we just heard Luz talk about, everything that K. Scott has talked about, is a result of what happens to us between the ages of zero to eight. It is mind boggling, correct? And when we talk about within the context of this conversation tonight around domestic violence, and I believe and I know that Jessica here would be in total agreement that as we get ready to start rounding this conversation out, that we're talking about primary prevention, starting to look at what life looks like for a child when they first come into this world. What we know now is that in utero, as that child is being carried, I can remember one of the first candlelight vigils that, and I actually worked at the bridge for 19 years. One of the women shared about how her partner had physically assaulted her. She was probably about three or four weeks out from having delivered her baby, and he wanted to be intimate with her, right? So go back to that, 33% of women who show up at the emergency room, sexual assault by a partner, okay? So he wanted to be intimate. She did, she was like, I can't do this, move the story along. He physically assaulted her. He left and told her when he came back he was going to finish what he started. Well, again, I told you she had just delivered a baby three weeks. She goes to the other room. How many of you have had babies recently? So, well, <laughs> she, oh, I love her. She, mm. So here's the thing. You don't invite Thesha over when you got a three-week-old baby, right? Because y'all probably can tell I got a big mouth. I'm loud, okay? So you're like, no, boo, you can't come over here, right? Because when that baby is asleep, that's your time to get sleep, correct? Well, she goes to the other room where her three-week-old baby was laying, and what she found was a child that was sound asleep. Why? Because in utero, that baby had heard everything. This was the norm. 
And that's what I hear when I go to middle schools and high schools, that young people are telling me that the violence that is occurring there in their home is normal. So from that age of zero to 18, some of the behavior that is being formed is the behavior towards becoming a survivor, I prefer the term survivor of domestic violence, or becoming the person who causes harm because it is the norm. Looking at all the behaviors about the drug usage and the way that people have to numb themselves. How many times have I talked to individuals who've been in abusive relationships and they talk about being numb? For those of you who are going to education, social work, maybe you're going to be a social worker in education. I believe that so many of the children who are in special education, that really what we're seeing is forms of trauma, PTSD. That baby ain't got no ADHD, they got PTSD. <laughs> Cause they've been surviving a war at home, right? And so just being mindful of that, when we talk about the impact of domestic violence on children, it was probably around 2010, or 2008, that agencies actually began to hire child advocates. When I first started this work in 96, there was no such thing as child advocates. And what we realized is that we're doing all this work with the survivor. However, what about the children? What about the child who gets put out of childcare at three years old because they bite everybody? Or that as it actually happened in our, one of our child care centers is that they actually picked up a child because the child wouldn't let them play with a toy, so they picked them up by the neck, strangling them. That's right, because what? They are mimicking a behavior that they saw. So as we look around the world and say that the world is falling apart, no, the world is doing exactly what the world does because we have chosen to ignore the issue of domestic violence behind closed doors, okay? So I just wanted to share that and you know, to, to just uh, do a comma and to lose his love around wanting to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what's happening to our babies because those babies will then become adults, okay? And to add to that, Ms. Tisha, um, we just need to know what, what kind of kids we want at home. We want gentlemen and we want ladies. We have lost that where the gentlemen opened the door for the ladies. We have, you know, we have lost a lot of morals and, and values in our families. So we just want to bring them back and let them know that there's safety whenever we're educating them in the best of our knowledge. Okay, so we want to take the rest of the time that we have to answer what questions, you know, do you have burning um, surrounding domestic violence? Any um, specific questions that you want to hear more about? And any one of our panelists, feel free to go ahead and answer. So in, in order to make sure that the uh, people who are on Zoom can hear, so I'm going I'm to pass the microphone along, so please speak into the microphone. So thank you for this amazing talk. Thank you so much. Uh, my question was related to, uh, let me stand up. <laughs> uh, you know, we've sort of, as a professional, uh, uh, as a licensed social worker, I've seen in my life, we've, we do a lot of work on domestic violence after it happens, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I've always thought about this, that it's just too late. Right? I mean, if we really want domestic violence to stop, we should be teaching gender equality in grade two, justice, respect, you know, all kinds of things. Like by the time they get into a relationship and then they get hit and then we intervene, it's too late, you know? So I, I, just, wa I just wanted to know what your thoughts were about I mean, if we are really going to make an impact, then we have to start much earlier than that, right? So I just wanted to know your thoughts. Yeah, so uh, real quick, so yes, you're exactly right, we do. And I have this dream and I need to just do it. I need to stop dreaming and just make it happen. But you're right, This we st babies start learning, like we said, in year row, right? So as soon as a baby's born, as soon as they enter child care centers, my dream is that we're doing work with all toddler, infant, all those early childhood teachers. We're doing education with parents. We're talking about 
we're looking at like DEI stuff when they're babies, right? What is in those classrooms, right? How are we talking about people and acceptance and empathy and love? Because we know the root of domestic violence is oppression. It is power and control, right? Root is oppression. Until we start doing anti-oppression work in our culture and society and like wide stream anti-oppression work, because we know there's movements doing it, right? We need to fund those movements, put more money there. Start it, like I said, with babies in these child care centers, in schools. That is going to, one, that's going to help. Also, talk about boundaries. How often, right, do we treat little ones? Little ones, even babies, communicate a boundary. How does it, com we know when babies don't want to be touched. They're pulling away. They're crying, right? Do we listen? I'm guilty of not listening. No, we're changing this diaper. You fight me. Fine, fight me. I'm going to win. I'm stronger than you. I've been there, right? I'm, I've got kids, right? I, I messed up. How are we listening, even in those small ways, boundaries, talking about changing social norms of, oh, they're pulling their hair, that means they like you, right? We still say those things, don't we? we I, I, hear the, I hear the school teachers doing it. I have little ones. Guess what they gave for Mother's Day for mommies? Oven mitts. Guess what the daddy's got? Baseballs. Right, so even looking at gender socialization, this really strict expectation of gender socialization, why? Why? We're all humans, right? So really, like, looking, we need to start young, real young, doing the work with parents, work with teachers. And we are in elementaries and middle schools, we're talking about healthy relationships. What is a healthy relationship? What does a healthy argument really look like? Because we hear, hey, is it okay to argue with your partner? Young people are saying, no, you, can, you can't argue. Arguments are not okay. Well, hold up. So we always agree all the time? No. No, we don't. There are healthy ways to engage in argument and conflict, right, and accountability. But that's not, that, that, that's not their experience because they're seeing violence when it comes to arguments. That's what they're equating. So we talk about these things. We talk about bystander intervention. I'm sorry, I could go on for quite a while, clearly. I don't want to take too much of the Q&A time. But yes, we do whole like conversations, presentations, like get my card. I'd love to spread it with anyone. There's probably multiple people on this panel who would love to talk more with you about what we can do, movements surrounding getting this education, doing protective factors with children so that no one grows up thinking it's okay to harm someone. Maybe that's a part two in the, of this session. <laughs> but we have someone online, Sydney, who wants to, some advice on what to say to someone to help them get out of a domestic violence situation. And perhaps we can have the advocates, the survivor advocates speak on that. Um, so really quick, y'all, this is a heavy topic and, and I just shoot it straight from the hip. So this is my trigger warning. If, if you feel triggered, even after this, please take care of yourself, okay? Even if that means hugging a tree, putting your feet in the grass, whatever you take care of, please do it. Miss Sydney, um, I would, I would and, and hear my survivor's heart, it's... It's not for anyone to tell us what we should do. And I know that might be hard to accept, but if you really care and you really want to get your love and your point across to the person that you want to quote unquote leave that, that abusive relationship, my suggestion to you on what to quote unquote say is ask them, how can I support you? And that support might be just listening, and that's okay. The support might not align with what you want for them, and we've got to be okay with that, okay? And there is the National Domestic Violence Hotline that has trained advocates that you, you when you feel it's appropriate and it's authentic, um, suggest that person reach out to the 1-800 the National Domestic Violence Hotline, and then that person will know how to empower the person that's receiving the harm so that they make the best decision for us. Because oftentimes you all, and, and I say this in the room too, I know we mean well because we want that person to leave, but oftentimes when we hold space for people that we know are being abused and we say things like, oh, you should leave, or 
I wouldn't put up with that. That comes across very judgmental. And in that moment as a survivor myself, when I, when I heard that, it was validating the verbal abuse that I was receiving from my partner. For example, girl, I wouldn't put up with that. I would leave. Well, I didn't want to leave my apartment a partner like this young beautiful lady just said, for me, I just wanted the, the abuse to stop. So when the people that was trying to hold space for me, it just, it, in my mind, it validated that I wasn't deserving of love. I was not strong and not smart enough. So the best thing to do is just hold space, listen, and recommend them to the trained people that, that can say the things and do the things that is not going to cause further harm to the survivor. And mm -hmm. I never use the word victim unless we've lost that man or woman to uh, a homicide. We're not victims. We were victimized, but I'm absolutely not a victim. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to thank the panelists for coming and sharing their knowledge and teaching us about um, sexual abuse and domestic violence. Uh, my question is, when COVID-19 happened and those kids were in permanent homes that couldn't escape with either um, domestic violence abuse or sexual assault abuse, as a social worker, how can we help them and advocate for those people, for those kids who can't escape and, and are looking for help? Um, is there a different form or different ways that we could have done differently that, because I know the results and uh, the rates were increasing because uh, they didn't have like the help or didn't have that teacher to, or that social worker for them to um, help them out. So they were stuck in the homes. My question is that, thank you. I'll actually respond as a mom. Um, one, do not Can you put minimize, the mic a little closer to your mouth? Thank you. One, do not minimize the experience. And um, we're resourced in our household. I think it's important to understand the cultural aspects of the work that you're doing and that families show up very differently. And so when my daughter, so she's struggling if she... She's a straight-A student, and she's transitioning into fifth grade, but she's struggling right now. A couple of things happened. We went through domestic violence. We found out she's completely deaf in one ear, and then she's a fifth grader that's struggling. And I'm meeting with the school team, and she's saying, I'm not good enough. And she used the words, I don't want to live, and they took that and switched it to, she's going to kill herself. So now as a mom, and this, I found this out today, now as a mom, I feel challenged with a place that should create space and safety. And um, in addition to our home, I'm thinking, how can I support her? And now she's also where I can't return to school until I actually go do X. I would say continue to ask some more probing questions as a coach, as a counselor, find out what's underneath what this child is saying, because for her, performative matters. It matters to her to be an A student. So for her having a few um, bad grades or she lost her brother, her losing her brother, that's very challenging for her to process as a 10 year old, but as it's showing up in the classroom is, you guys need to do this and you guys cannot return to the school until you um, achieve this. I think there are some cultural nor norms, um, have a differentiated approach to how you are supporting families, understand the full family dynamics. I feel like we're being marginalized and oppressed because of how we show up. Oh, let, and, let, and let me just add to that. What's your name, sweetheart? Miss Cynthia, I'm looking around the room and I see the next generation and I honor y'all because, sweetheart, we haven't even seen the ramifications of the little people that suffered through the pandemic. So what I challenge you all to do is stay strong because your generation will be the generation that's gonna have to put your big person undies on and you're gonna have to fight the fight because it's gonna be hard. So you're gonna have to go to work every day and you have to remember your why. Because it's gonna be hard. I'll be long gone 
because it's going to take years for the shakeout, okay? So keep that to the at the top of your mind that there was a pandemic. So in 20 years, when you're hashing out the, the work, that you stay ever so present and, and um, intentional so that you can reach back to the young people coming behind you to remind them these are little people that are now adults that suffered in silence during a national pandemic, okay? Any other, okay. So you mentioned earlier the Batterers, Inter Batterers Intervention Prevention Program. I um, was a counselor at, for Harris County at the WIMAC program, and so we would have a lot of clients that would have to go through that program as well um, once they completed our program. But oftentimes they would come back and say, you know, oh, well, that's something that we have to pay for. You know, I don't understand why, if it's something that I need to do, why am I having to pay all of this money for it? So that was always a question that I had. Like, if this is something that is going to benefit, you know, the people that are actually, you know, doing the domestic violence, why are they having to pay so much money to, you know, get the treatment that they need? So there's a thing, I'm pretty sure everybody heard the cliche, if you do the crime, you got to, or you do the t time, you got to pay the crime, you know, that cliche. So they have to put some skin in the game. Just think about it, if it was something for free, they'd be like, mm, I'm not really going to be interested in it. But now it's something that they invested, dang, I got to act on that investment now, right? So it comes to a part where, yes, they have to pay for it, right? But, or however, it is an investment into themselves that they have to think about. Just like if they were purchasing some property, right? You may be negative at first, possibly, but just no long term it's gonna pay off. And so that's what kind of like long story short, what I will say is that it's just an investment that you're putting forth to reinvest into yourself for your personal growth to help everybody around you. No. Skin in the game. So let me do a follow-up also. And this may be antiquated because, you know, doing this almost for 30 years now, I'm realizing that things are changing. However, it is part of the accountability. I'm not going to ask anyone to out themselves, but, you know, if you get a ticket, anybody here who's ever gotten a ticket? All right, so, so you're feeling some kind of way, right? And nine times out of 10, when the speed limit say 50, you're not going to floor it at 75, right? Because your heart starts to race and your, and your pocketbook starts to hurt. That's the reality. That's called accountability. And for some reason, we don't like accountability anymore in this world. So part of the reason they pay is for the accountability. I drive a lot more careful when I'm on the beltway. I don't go 80, even though my car could be zooming at 120. I like to hold on my money. I don't want Houston or Harris County having my paycheck. So I'm going to drive a little bit more careful because I remember the last ticket I got, and I want my money. Okay. It is. So it's on a sliding scale. So if they're complaining, here's the thing, that the CEO at a company that's making 500000 I don't know what their fees are, but they may pay $300 for the class. The person who is in between jobs, they may be paying $5. So it's going to be based on their income. So it's not like you're going to ask someone who's making $20,000 a year to pay $500 for a class. So it's the accountability part. So, and they've also, if, they were on, if they're on probation or parole, they got to pay. The criminal justice people out here. Now, we could say a whole lot of things about that, that that helps people keep people oppressed. So I'm, I'm all with that conversation as well. However, because of they have committed a crime, and we've got to remember, domestic violence is a crime. Now, to backtrack that, talking about primary prevention, I think the young lady who was sitting there, is that's why I believe that primary prevention is so important, that it should be a part of schools. Talking about social workers, and we can get the mic over here because I don't, she's got a question, that thinking about social emotional learning, <laughs> right, uh, that we do the primary prevention, teaching people how to have a relationship. And we take it for granted that people know how to have a relationship. Had I not been doing this work for the last 28 years, I can tell you that I have grown as an individual in my private life. I come from a pretty decent family, but nobody ever sat me down and said, Thesha, this is what you should expect in a relationship. And I think most families are not doing that. I don't know what the reasons are, but they're not doing it. So part of that primary prevention and talking about social workers, 
what I am finding is that there aren't social workers in every school. I thought social workers were in every school. So we've got to start saying what's important to us as a nation. And if the social workers and counselors are there, they're there to help people to get into college. Well, I just had a conversation, uh, and Jamie down there, we, we uh, went to a particular institution, and a young woman's falling apart because her parents were arguing all the way to her school, and she can't keep her mind focused. So, yeah, social worker, you're helping. I'm getting ready to wrap it up. Social worker, you're helping that young man or young woman get into college, but if they've been witnessing domestic violence at home, they can't keep their minds on their study. So we've got to start asking, where are we putting our money? Yes. Okay, so my, I don't know, can you hear me? Okay, my question is for Luz. Um, how do you breach the language barrier between a Hispanic parent and, you know, how you talked about doing homework with them or going to, like, Tuesday nights, sc school event? How do you breach that language barrier when they don't have the education or they don't speak the language that the student is receiving assignments, homework, and so on? Well... I have experience that I have had uh, with the parents is uh, we come to the schools or they even call me um, to get some translation done. S whenever the kids start school, they give them some kind of a test of uh, if they're going to be in a bilingual class or they're going to be in English class or just a Spanish class. When the parents start coming to the schools and being part of the, of the classes with the teachers, counselors, they're going to see that there is a lot of English homework, right? Okay, so how is it that I'm, I'm going to put it as myself. I am, as a parent, coming to the teacher and telling them, can you explain to me? And that's when we want to learn ourselves, too. And we want to learn um, English classes. So we have to look for an English class. So we also have to start the educational part. Because there's not always going to be somebody there that's going to be translating. But looking for that help in the schools and having the teachers understand that these parents don't speak the language and don't understand the homework, that would have them in their mind, this child needs help. So we've had on our classes on Tuesdays that do you understand any kind of paperwork in English? Do you understand what you're signing? Because there's parents that even sign the paperwork not even knowing what they're signing. So they bring it to us, um, and we help them understand. Example, I had this lady that she had uh, her child going to be changed from schools. They send her a big package, and they just highlighted where she needed a sign. I asked her, Did, can you go back to the school and tell them to give you the Spanish version of this application. Yes, they did. So it's just the parent asking the schools for that help. Can I add something? What's your name, sweetheart? Andrea. Andrea, does that, does that bother you that there's a gap there? So I would challenge you to look for opportunities to advocate to fill that gap because your community needs you, okay? Yes. That breaks my heart. Your community needs you. If you ask the question, the creators put it on your heart and you're the answer, part of the answer, okay? And okay, so we have time. two more things to that. I apologize, but you know, we got the form, right? So here's the thing that any, for the most part, I'm going to say, and someone here can correct me, that as a educational institution, we've got domestic violence programs. There's something called limited English proficiency. And to be ordered to provide what we call culturally competent services, that should not have even had to have been asked for, that part. However, I will concur with Jamie we need people to advocate because that should have been given without question as far as limited English proficiency. And also, again, I want to keep circling us back to this conversation around domestic violence. When we talked earlier about isolation, that individuals, that English is not their first language, whether it be Spanish, Creole, Twi, whatever the case may be, that part of that isolation is we think that... These people, this person's been here for 10 years and they don't speak English? Well, no, because part of the isolation is you don't get to show up for an ESL class. Even though the ESL class is free, and what I've started saying, the class may be free, but if you're not free to go, that part. And so even asking that, that if the primary caregiver in that relationship does not speak the language, is that also a part of the tactic to keep that person in that relationship? Okay, 
We have one final question before we wrap up. Uh, first, thank all of you uh, for coming. And as a survivor myself, uh, and being in social work, it is hard for this topic for me. And uh, through Harris County, I did not know all the services that should have been offered to me years ago. I know them now and I'm very, um, because I'm going into the career, I'm very happy for it. And like you stated, everything you stated, I felt like you were saying my life. Uh, but that's the thing is, um, I, eight years old, my daughter was suicidal and she got, uh, she got tested and they told me she was ADHD. 18 years old, she's in college now. Um, she got tested again and she's PTSD. You know, and I'm so fortunate that she's able to break that stigma and able to, to, to finally do that. But I feel like even now, the healing is so hard for me. The healing for her is so hard. And just having that communication and having that bond within each other and within the other children in the household, it's hard. And I hear all of you talk about healing, but when does the healing ever start? start or stop or, um, you know, cause I feel like I have been healing, but then there's times where I'm falling apart, you know? Ooh, um, I know. So I'm much. sorry. Okay. Thank you so much for your transparency. What's your name? Carla. Carla. Um, I'll share what has worked for me and maybe that will work for you. I think we heard of ACEs, so I experienced 10 out of the 10 ACEs by the time I was a certain age. I did not realize that they would show up with me now being in my 40s, mid 40s. And what was dropped in my spirit is that I needed to go back in time and one, um, forgive whoever caused me harm when I was heartbroken at five years old at 10 years old, at 15 years old, at 20 years old. You see where I'm going? And often we hold on to some shame associated with whatever our experiences was. And so we try to suppress that. And often there is an opportunity for us to also forgive ourselves because we have somehow taken on that harm, that hurt, that broken heartedness. And another way to look at that, uh, another way to even look at um, a space of healing would be, you guys heard them say agape, is you've got to love all of the experiences. So the acronym that I use is remember who you are. Remember your power. Embrace your uniqueness. The thing that I was trying to hide behind my smile was what brought me to this conversation and on this movement that I am on. And until I acknowledged that that was my story, my uniqueness, and I accepted that um, it's a part of my experiences, but it doesn't define who I am as a person, invest in yourself. Invest in yourself, mind, uh, mind body, and spirit. And so for me as a Christian, prayer, is helpful, but I also like long walks in the park. And there's something about either meditation, our mindfulness, our long walks in the part, park, and quietness, where you will hear those voices and be able to reflect on the young person that has not been healed or the young person that has not been loved. G, give of your gift. And so those of you that are in the room today, I want you to reflect on why you are here. Because there is a reason that you signed up to drive in traffic or remain in traffic or remain downtown with the storm that's going on around us. Um, when we understand our why, that can help catapult us and other people to other spaces. I realized that my gifting 
was what have I have been holding behind my smile. So my gift is to be able to authentically have a conversation about the harm and the hurt and the aces, and I give that gift away. And then in, I call it next on your journey, is start thinking about how you can support your daughter, how you can support other women or other men in your community to be able to learn from your experiences so that they can too be liberated from those experiences. So I would just say, the more that you lean into it, what will happen is the universe will continue to reveal the parts of you that you have suppressed, that you can love because she was a, she's important too. Is that helpful? And I'm going to just piggyback. Carla, sis, I honor you. Yeah. I honor you. I honor you. I don't even know how many times you've probably even ever said that out loud, loud in community. So right there is going to be liberation. Right? So three things. I honor you. We need you. The journey, it's a journey. It's a journey, sis. We're going to be on it for the rest of our lives. And here's the thing, the student, the teacher shows up when? When the student is ready. So the fact that you admit it out loud to the universe, that you thought you were healed, oh, be ready. It's coming. It's coming. And here's the thing, we need you. Your 18-year-old daughter, we have got to be intentional about shifting the cycle, and we want to start our healing journey because whoever the creator has designed us to help liberate, if we don't start our journey, we'll bleed on the people that we're supposed to be helping. So the fact that you're opened up to it, your journey is going to look a whole lot different. But when you get on the other side and you're ready to come join us on this fight, let me know. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn. I need sisters and brothers in the movement. Okay. All right, right on, okay, okay, you got this. Another thing I wanted to add is empower each other, empower each other, educate each other. Uh, we have to make a difference in our children for them to know what to expect in their future. We don't have to be, you know, uh, back in time. We, we, we're 2023 is our year. We need to make a change. And as long as we start changing ourselves, we're going to see that change. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you to everyone um, for coming to this panel, for holding space here today, for being here today. I think this is such a beautiful way to end, remembering your why. Why are you in this room? What are you going to sort of take from today, right, to, to be the change. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to everyone that's on Zoom. And thank you so much to our wonderful panelists um, for spending your Thursday night here with us. We really appreciate it. And um, we encourage you to take the survey if you want to see more of these types of um, vital voices here at UHD, other topics that you're interested about. Please take the survey um, and safe travels tonight if it's still wet on the roads. Thank you so much.